This program was made possible by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. We welcome you again to our ongoing roundtable discussions of the Gospels in the New Testament. We've been discussing the Sermon on the Mount and today we're going to begin talking about the, uh, the early parables of Jesus that we find in Matthew chapter 13. Joining me today from the religion faculty here at BYU is Brother Ray Huntington from the Department of Ancient Scripture. Also from the Department of Ancient Scripture is Brother David Whitchurch. And right to my immediate left is Sister Camille Franck, also a professor of ancient scripture. Well, today we're going to start with Matthew chapter 13, but I thought before we would jump into that, I think as we talk about Jesus' teaching, one verse that really can be a good springboard into his discussions of parables and teaching of parables is right at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that we discussed last time, is in the Joseph Smith translation of verse 37 or verse 29 in the authorized King James Version. Uh, it says, For he taught them as one having authority. And uh, the JST says, For he taught them as one having authority from God and not as having authority from the scribes. What, they, what is he talking about? What is Jesus' teaching like? What's his teaching methodology and how is it different than anything that they're used to? And then we'll use that as a springboard into his use of parables. What is meant by that phrase? He's not teaching like the scribes. He's teaching with real authority. Scribes are quoting precedents of how many of the, the great gurus of the past. Christ has authority in and of himself. He doesn't need, he is the authority. He is the final word. And that would sound very different from what they would hear recitation of rabbi after rabbi after rabbi for how many generations. I, I think, too, that his education was different than what the scribes would have been. He hadn't grown up in the education system of the day, so to speak, and, and it does take them off guard. Plus, he does speak from, from authoritative perspective. This is, this is the way it is and not quoting so on, according to so-and-so, this right. is the way it, does, it is. He doesn't have he to doesn't quote do that. oral traditions and oral law because he's the lawgiver. Well, and when he speaks, you sense that. Uh, the scribes were speaking from perspectives of uh, my mentor or this school of thought believes this versus this school of thought believes this. And so sometimes there are these debates with these schools of thoughts regarding divorce or marriage or this or that, and Jesus didn't debate. He gave an answer, he and just it was said, a very this clear is the way answer. It is. Mm -hmm. And they knew it. People, it, 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 it took them back, I and mean, they were they were just uh, um, astonished, impressed, moved by it. It was different teaching. Well, let's look at uh, in verse three of Matthew thirteen. Uh, because this goes right now with his teaching style, his teaching authority, as well as his teaching methodology. It says in verse 3, He spake many things unto them in parables. Now, would that be different? What we've said before is his teaching was not like the scribes, but what about this idea of the use of parables? Was that dramatically different? Is Jesus the innovator of parables? What's going on and why does he use parables? I think part of the clue for why he uses parables is that we see it in Matthew's account in chapter 12, we're starting to see the opposition against him and his teachings beginning to mount. His disciples have gone through the grain field and they've plucked wheat or grain on the Sabbath and they begin to winnow and thresh and Which winnow according it. According to the tradition. According to the tradition, they're, he's breaking the Sabbath and, and, and they're beginning to accuse him of teaching by the power of Be Beelzebub and healing by his power. And, and so all of a sudden he shifts his teaching instead of being so straightforward. It's, it's this concept of uh, parables where no longer is it as easy to condemn him for that which he says, but he's still able to teach for those that have ears, let them hear. 
What is a parable? It, it, it's a parabola. It means to, a, a setting side by side. So you begin to make these comparisons. So it to doesn't realize. have to be a story per se. No. We think no. of parables as stories, no. but parables would be anything that is providing some type of a comparison of something. Which was a typical way of teaching and communicating in that in that culture. We can see examples of them used in in the Old Testament yeah. as well. Par parables were not new to Jews. Mm -hmm. Okay, they, they they knew what they were and they used them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, then. He's using these parables to, you say, to protect himself? Is that what you're saying? I suppose at times it could be, uh, th th that could be very well a part of it. But also there's a, I think the teaching style lends itself to deepen understanding for those that really are in tune. So it gives him an opportunity to continue to teach, to deepen the teaching for those that are true disciples. Okay, some people have said uh, that Jesus used parables to reveal and to conceal. And as the, the point you just made is that maybe he's concealing from those that, that didn't have the Spirit and revealing to those that did. But now, Camille, you had a discussion earlier about that as to well, what did you think about that? Well, I think that's pretty much the reason we get in chapter 13 that he gives why he teaches in parables. But if we stop there, I think we run into a few challenges. First one, right here in chapter 13, who is it that comes after Jesus after he's taught some of these parables saying, I don't understand. And I think it's interesting that the Lord is not chastening them saying, you ought to repent, you're wicked at heart, you're not ready for this. He explains to them item by item what it means. I think there's another reason that comes through that it's t of teaching parables from the example in chapter 13, and that is it separates, naturally separates those who have a desire to understand more from this large multitude that might have ulterior motives that are there and when they come asking with sincere questions what does this mean he is very clear and very open and very patient with them in explaining it so he finds hand picks um, it it self selects Selective. A, a an audience that is ready to hear much deeper and broader teachings than the hecklers you know, just just add what you said mark in talking about parables makes this statement this is mark 4 verse 34 but without a parable spake he not unto them, and when they were alone, he expounded all things right. to yeah, his disciples. Right. That's why um, Elder McConkie made this statement that in Third Nephi, when the Savior goes to visit the Nephites, he doesn't speak in parables mm -hmm. because there's an audience prepared to hear and he can speak directly. Yeah. But on the other hand, there's examples in the New Testament of the Savior actually using parables specifically for the wicked, to teach the wicked so they can't possibly misunderstand. Right. I think of the parable of the wicked husbandman, um, who, and they perceived he spoke of them. Caught up with them, finally. They, they nailed him right there. In, in fact, uh, we could maybe say that uh, while we are introducing parables here, Jesus is using parables throughout his ministry. And what, and what we're talking about in Matthew 13 might be called the early parables. Then late, we have later parables, and then the parables that he gives on the Temple Mount during the last week would be parables of chastisement that you just right. pointed out. So his parables are the whole gamut from the very early believers to those that are seeking to cause him to stumble in some way and are seeking to put him to death. So we have a broad spectrum. Now why do, does he talk to the wicked though in parables rather directly sometimes. Why doesn't he just come right out? You know, Brand, I, I think there's this aspect of mercy you know, that, are involved, that, that is involved in a parable. Uh, if, if Jesus speaks directly so that there's no misunderstanding, so that they know exactly what he's talking about, uh, particularly if he chastises them and calls them to repentance, you know, if they're not willing to do it, if they refuse to do it, there, there's, a, there's that condemnation, that act of justice. But if they, if they don't understand what he's talking about, if, if they don't catch it at that point, they're really not under any condemnation. It may be that later, as they think and ponder and maybe allow the Spirit to touch their heart, they realize, oh, oh, I see. Uh, maybe then they're in a position uh, to, to do something about it. Maybe they're going to have that change of heart. But at least... Uh, it may provide a period of time for them to get their life in order. Well, you know, that makes a lot of sense, especially in light of counsel that the Savior gave to the Twelve that we didn't discuss in the Sermon on the Mount, where he basically talks to them about 
milk before meat and don't cast your uh, pearls before swine, yeah. I think there is a, a tenderness or a mercy or a line upon line, precept upon precept approach to teaching the gospel as well. But I think that you underscore something else, that another reason. He's not teaching parables simply to buy time until he can get to those that he mm -hmm. really wants to be able to teach the good stuff. He teaches marvelous truths through parables. Mm -hmm. and, and that he can teach those that have hearts to hear and ears to hear and eyes to see, as well as those who are not ready to make those kind of commitments, but in a way that has meaning. Parables are very powerful teaching tools, the way he teaches them. And, and in fact, you know, uh, with parables in his teaching when we speak to reveal and to conceal, one of the ways of revealing is that there are multiple layers to the, the parables. And so once you peel back, it's kind of like an onion, once you peel back one layer, you just keep going and going and going. And so well, even though he gives interpretations to many of these early parables, oftentimes there's even more profound messages hidden beneath them that we go a little bit further. Well, look, I think one of the real questions uh, that we ought to look at, too, is if Jesus is using parables, and they're somewhat familiar with parables, and unfortunately, maybe in our, in our day, we want more direct teaching rather than, than parables, how do we interpret parables? What, how do we go about looking at Matthew 13 and, and then elsewhere in the New Testament where Jesus is giving his parables, and how are we going to be able to interpret these kinds of things? seems like one of the ways that, and that one that Joseph Smith has directed us and given us indication is look at the setting, look at the context, look at who it, he's speaking to. And a lot of times we can see it in that specific circumstance and then be able to draw from that for our own day. Or is there a question mm -hmm. that, that somebody asked Jesus, such as the, uh, the lawyer who said, well, who's my neighbor? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Jesus gives the parable of the, of the Good Samaritan to, to answer that question. So is there, a, is there a question that draws out the parable? And, and I think it goes back to what Camille was saying. Examine the setting, you know, what's going on here. Yeah, the context for it, yeah. the setting, the question. And, uh, and then I think also we, we are blessed with uh, additional revelation that uh, yeah. oftentimes brings additional insight into what's being said. Let me share this quote from Joseph Smith. He says, he's speaking of the parable of the prodigal son. In reference to the prodigal son, what is the rule of interpretation? Just no interpretation at all. Understand it precisely as it reads. I have a key by which I understand the scriptures. I inquire, what was the question that drew out the answer or caused Jesus to utter the parable? To ascertain its meaning, we must dig up the root and ascertain what it was that drew the saying out of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I think that's what both Ray and, and Camille were you have the to. exact quote, and that is very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> That's better than what we have to say. Well, let's look then at these parables. We've set the stage as to what is a parable and that why Jesus is using them, how to interpret them. Well, let's look at some of these parables, these what we would call the early parables. Well, let's use the rules that the prophet Joseph gives us and says, what is the context? What is the question? What is going to come out of it? What is going on that is going to introduce us to the parable of the sower or the parable of the pearl of great price or the mustard seed or these that we see? What do we see in common with all of these? Well, I, I think there's a big picture as far as context and background here, and that yeah. is that most of these parables that are, that are listed here in chapter 13, and it is a chapter that's filled one right after the other, it's only found in the Gospel of Matthew. And when you think of Matthew writing to the audience, a Jewish audience, an audience who is expecting, has already tradition surrounding the coming of the kingdom of God, which is primarily what each of these parables is looking at. And the, and the problem is what the Jews were expecting and the, their definition, their anticipation, expectation of the kingdom of God is quite different from the way it actually is occurring. And consequently, they run the risk of missing it. I mean, you think of, of the Jews expecting some spontaneous, immediate, spectacular, overthrow of the enemy, the Romans, who's come just for the house of Israel to preserve them. A messianic golden age of yes. some sort. This, these parables describe quite a different perspective and feel for the process of coming. You know, as I look at these, all of chapter 13, again, we talked a little, he, he precedes this with the opposition that's mounting. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. In chapter 13, all of these parables are, again, it comes back to where's your heart. It's separating the good from the bad. It's the gathering of the house of Israel. Um, yeah, in, in fact, going right along with both of those comments that we've established the kingdom by calling and ordaining apostles. We have introduced the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we talked about in the sermon, and in the context of faith, repentance, baptism. So it's the coming of the, the kingdom. And we have the disciples. Are you going to be a real disciple? Are you going to pay what it needs to be paid to be a true yeah, disciple? Yeah, what you see in chapter 13, going along with what you said, Brant, uh, is... Uh, or, or our parables uh, regarding how, how a person has uh, their heart softened to accept the gospel, to accept the word, the parable of the sower, um, a parable uh, uh, regarding opposition, and um, the, the wheat and the tares, you know, mm -hmm. there's going to be opposition to the kingdom. The kingdom is to be seen as a pearl of great price, something of great value. All of the parables have as that common thread the growth of the kingdom of God yeah. in this it, sense. And how does it describe the growth? Yeah. I think, one, it's not even a zucchini plant, mm -hmm. which is pretty spectacular. I mean, yeah. isn't amazing? You don't have to plant it, I swear. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about, um, you know, you put three measures of meal, mm -hmm. um, three measures of le the leaven in the three measures of meal, watching bread rise, watching a little plant grow. You think about the, the, the expectation when you plant that first little seed in the Dixie cup um, as mm -hmm. a kid and expect to see it within moments start sprouting green and yet when it becomes a tree this he's talking about this becomes a tree magnificent with birds or angels as as joseph smith talks about it ministering to the to the gospel um, it is remarkable it is mir miraculous uh, joseph smith did so much of making application of these parables to the restored gospel and when you think about 1830 of six members of the church mm -hmm. And then you talk about the process as with nurturing uh, time in the right circumstances, what has happened. There are those um, sociologists in the world that just stand back in amazement to see what's happened to those six little members and what's happened with the growth and, and the fruits that have come from this. Well, I think even the apostles may have been asking the questions, how, how, how's this kingdom going to work? What's going to happen? You know, we've been called as apostles, we, we have uh, disciples, we have a following. Where do we go from here? What, what's what's going to happen? I think these, this, these parables, these collected parables in Matthew 13, really answer the questions because it has everything in here. Missionary work, testimony, opposition. And, 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 and with the missionary work, verses 47 and 48, I think are, are amazing because who gets to come into the gospel net? We're not just talking house of Israel here. It's Fishes of every, every kind. Mind. Yet, I'm, uh, probably at that time, they couldn't they even don't comprehend it, but no. I how much any, they more than, any more than any more than in the Peter Whitmer home. You know, anybody understood what was going on as well. Uh, well, let's go back to the parable of the of the sower, because I think that, I think it's purposeful that it's placed where it is, because it is first letting that seed take root before we can get the kingdom going mm -hmm. forth and doing all the things that we see. Elder Talmage calls it the parable of the four kinds of soil. It's, it's not really the sower that's the, the issue there. It's, it's the seed. What do you draw from that parable? What is it you think that Jesus is saying to us, to them in their day, but also to us in our day, as we are able to watch with 2,000 years of hindsight to the growth of the kingdom? I think he's speaking of institutions as well as individuals in this. What do you see in, this, in these parables? Verses here. You know, to me, the key uh, on the parable of the sower is when the Savior responds and begins to explain the parable. Um, in verse 19, when, any, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. Mm -hmm. It's that phrase that was sown in his heart that becomes so critical to, to all of these is how are the, how's your soil prepared? Right. And, and, and you talk about the application for today. You know, he describes the types of soil. Is it, it just a thin layer mm -hmm. on top of a rocky surface that when it begins to grow eventually those roots have nowhere to go right. and, and we're not going to be able to produce fruit. I think it's also saying to us none of, no disciple should be surprised if Satan's going to come after your, mm -hmm. the growth of your seed. I think he's saying right out of the chute you're going to have some opposition. You're going to have some trials of your faith. So what is he saying 
you think there to his disciples of that day on where do you put the seed? What, what do you want to have in, going on in your life there? There certainly has to be a preparation of a person's heart. Now, the people hearing this are going to hopefully uh, individualize this and understand what he's talking about, as well as those that are going to be, going to be doing missionary work. But he talks about the wayside soil. Well, that, that's an interesting uh, visual. Um, you'd have this plot of ground that you would till up, and, and you'd take the seeds, and you'd go out and chuck them left and right. Um, always outside that, that planting area was the area that you would walk. And, and property in the Middle East tended to stay in families for hundreds of years, and people would be walking on that for uh, long periods of time, such that it would be become hardened and baked by the sun. It would be almost like cement. Mm -hmm. And when you threw your seeds out there, those seeds that, that landed on that wayside soil, that compact cement-type soil, uh, they, they couldn't be tilled into the ground. They were, they were surface and uh, the birds would quickly come and eat it up. And, and later he says, you know, that's, it's, um, it, it's comparing uh, our hearts to a heart that is hardened. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I, I can't speak for you, for you but I, I remember a, a, a person uh, years ago in, in one of the um, wards that I lived in, um, I was really angry at him. I, I had some feelings towards him. And uh, I remember one sacrament meeting, I came in and sat down with my wife, and I looked up, and he was on the stand with his wife. And I thought, it's okay if he says the prayer, but if he's the sacrament speaker, I'm not going to listen to a word. And uh, it turned out that he was the sacrament speaker. And, and I remember just hardening my heart. I, I just, I, there's nothing you can say to me that I'm going to listen to. I don't want to hear it. And um, um, a after the meeting, and my wife knew what I was up to, um, and she said that was a good meeting, and I said, I didn't think so. Uh, she said there were good things that were said in that meeting. I said, I didn't hear any of it, and I didn't. I hardened my heart, and uh, I, I think the Savior, this, this is not just for the, you know, the real way. This is for everybody here, yeah. that we need to keep our hearts pliable and soft. In fact, one of the things of what you just said with that experience, I think we can all relate to, I think the parable of the sower is not just talking about different kinds of people, I think in some respects it's talking about different times and seasons exactly. in our own lives. It's the same person right. who may experience the and, challenges. And how are we going to receive that yeah. seed? Because it's easy for us to say, well, I can understand why so-and-so didn't accept the gospel because that, that seed was on that stony path or whatever. <clears throat> I think we ought to look at this, uh, this parable as maybe those seeds in those four different kinds of soil affect me at different times in my life and I have to look at that personally. Let, let me just add to that too, as you talk about the final production, of it, whether it's different times in our life we produce more or less or mm -hmm. whether it's different individuals, that when it's all said and done there are different amounts mm -hmm. that are going to be reaped as a result of these seeds that are planted and there are those that are going to come forth thirtyfold and sixtyfold that really we are individuals in different mm -hmm. situations and, and the Lord doesn't expect us all to bring forth bushels and bushels that depending on where we're at, we give all that we can and bless yeah. the kingdom in our own way as long as we're willing to give our all. I think that's an excellent point and it reminds me of a thought from Brigham Young where he talks about whether we do little or much, if we're doing the best we can, it is the same as the angels of heaven that are doing the best they can as well. Well, what about those, we've talked about the parable of the sower. What do we see as we lump all those others together about what we would call the parables of the kingdom? These early parables are characterized as the parables of the kingdom. What do we learn about the, the wheat and the tares? Now, we have that in the Doctrine and Covenants as well, but what message is the Savior saying to his disciples then and to us now about wheat and tares? Wait. And what do you mean by that, Camille? Because that is probably the hardest thing for a lot of us to do. What's he saying? Um, in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about being merciful to others, and we will receive mercy to, to treat others as we would like to be treated ourselves. And there's something, and judging not unrighteously, mm -hmm. the idea that there is time um, and an opportunity for each one of God's children to, to um, make some changes in their life. Right. And, I, and I think in along with that, the wheat and the tares, you have to understand what that concept of a tear is like. Yeah. I mean, you say wait. 
but but Satan, the evil one, has sown mm -hmm. terrors uh, amongst us, amongst the church, and, and, they're and so there has similar, to be patience. So and mm -hmm. that idea of not judging is so critical mm -hmm. to understanding that there will come a time when people you know, will be judged. It's hard for us not only to say "Thy will be done," but "Thy time will be done," and I think that's one of the important things that we <clears> see is that the parables of the kingdom are telling us that the Lord's will is going to be done. The kingdom is going to go forth like Daniel saw in vision. Jesus is teaching us in parables that it's going to go forth and fill the world. It's going to be that great mustard tree. It's going to do all those things. The real question is not so much about the kingdom, but about us as members of that kingdom. Are we going to be wheat or tares in that regard? For more information on this program, visit our website at broadcasting.byu.edu. This program was made possible by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.